Have you ever wondered if robots are going to take your job? That's what we'll talk about today. Will robot teachers replace human teachers? No, but they can complement them. Donald A. Norman, Emotional Design. Hi, this is Jill from the North Woods. I decided to pick up on this moniker. If you listen to me on Allison's podcast at podfeet.com, I'm called Jill from the North Woods. And I found out when I did a presentation at a conference, people knew me as Jill from the North Woods. And I love that moniker, so I decided to take it on in this podcast, Jill from the North Woods. Today, we're going to talk about whether robots are going to take our jobs and if we should worry about it, or better yet, what can we do about it? I picked up the book called Don't Worry About the Robots, How to Survive and Thrive in the New World of Work by Dr. Michelle Dickinson, Dr. Joe Cribb, and David Glover. This is a compilation of essays written about whether or not the work world is going to be harsh to us as AI robots start taking over the world of work. I don't know that this was exactly the book I thought it was, but it gave me a good launching point to talk about this topic and some of the things it did mention. It says that there's a lot of panic out there. Some estimates show that 40% of jobs could disappear in the next 20 years. I thought this podcast episode is great, considering that last week we talked about Battlestar Galactica and the robots taking over everybody's job, and then eventually destroying all of humanity. Hopefully we're not going to get quite so apocalyptic about what's going to happen to our work world. It's been happening for a really long time, this conversion to robots. You ask anyone who worked in a factory 20 years ago, robots came in and started doing factory work. And sure enough, there are less factory jobs needed than ever. It did put people out of work, for sure. And as we're getting now into this age of AI, we think about maybe not the fantastic writers, the Hollywood writers, the book writers. We're more worried about how do we ever get junior writers, junior copywriters, junior programmers to be fantastic writers, programmers 20 years from now. If they never get a job at the beginning of their career in entry level, the AI is going to do it all for us. There's some really big questions here, and I don't know what the answers are. I mean, think about it even from my own podcast. I'm not a very good writer. I could have hired someone on TaskRabbit or some of these other services to do copywriting for me, to do my show notes, my website, but I turned to AI instead. It's probably a couple hours a week for me to hire someone to do those tasks. Save me a bunch of money, but it also means that there was someone out there who would have taken that job to help me put my podcast together that no longer is needed. Then again, these robots and these AIs are doing jobs that you may not want to do. Again, like me, I'm not particularly good at writing, so it's doing something I'm not good at. And even in some cases, doing dangerous jobs. I saw this robot that was acting as a bomb destroyer so that if you think something is potentially dangerous, you can send this robot in to destroy whatever it is you think might be a bomb. We have these robots that are vacuuming our house. It's probably not taking any jobs per se, but saving us a little bit of time. And there's always that age-old analogy about the last buggy whip maker, right? You had horse and buggy, and you had to have all the things that go with having a horse and buggy. And the car put those people out of work. You don't need all the things, the fancy buggies, the doors, the buggy whip, all those jobs got taken away because technology moved on and became cars. So a lot of times people will call it creative destruction. Something happened in the world, made the world a better place, and now it's actually causing damage to some people. Other people just call it destruction, destruction. I suppose it depends on what side of the jobs you're on. And then when factory workers got laid off, you saw some newspapers and journalism outfits say, oh, well, become a developer. Go learn how to develop. And being a little bit passe about it. And when the news agencies started laying off people because of AI, yep, those factory workers came back and said, oh, well, why don't you become a developer? (laughs) 
we're not very sympathetic to the people around us losing jobs because of the progress of time, robots, AI, and just how the world changes. And so the question is for all of us, what do we do about that? What can we do in order to make sure we have a future in this new science fiction world? This book recommends that there's going to be a lot of tasks and skills needed from our future workers. More math, more science, more programming, more technical skills, but also more soft skills when it comes to communication, interpersonal workings. AI and robots can do a lot of things, but relating to other people can't do it all. I think about my own job. I used to go into organizations and meet people where they're at. If they're knowledgeable about software but afraid of the technology, I help work with that. If they were terrible at technology and hated the software, I worked with that too. Robots can't do that. They can provide education. They can spit out different types of training tasks that a person can use to learn it. In order to make technology work for people in real-life human problems, a lot of times it takes someone like me and some other people out there to make sure that those technologies work for people. And that's going to take human skills. So there's a place for us in this world. Are there going to be a lot of tasks that go away? Manual tasks, some dangerous tasks, some even some math calculations and science calculations. Heck, I was even reading about how robots and AI were looking for liver cancer in slides. And it was able to not only find 40% more possible cancers inside of a slide, but it was also able to determine when something was a false positive. It looked like maybe it was going to be cancer, maybe it was potentially something dangerous, and it turned out not to be. So not only was it doing a better job than trained technicians at looking at a slide, determining what's dangerous, but also not scaring people, was something that turned out not to be dangerous. They said that one AI was almost like 100 different opinions at once looking at a particular x-ray, a scan, and being able to come up with a better decision. And they say that there's going to be four different types of movements, they think, in this book when it comes to our future work. One, of course, is going to be that automation of robots and artificial intelligence, but also the gig economy and how we're going to learn so much better because we're going to have these new amazing tools. And then we're also going to have to look at how government policies are going to affect these new technologies, too. So those are the four things it has us watching out for. The gig economy has been wonderful for a lot of people, being able to work at their own schedule, do things like if you're an artist, you can hire someone to create podcast art for you. My intro music was someone on a gig site selling their music to people who might have a podcast, might have a movie, might want to do something with music. I am not a musician. So me being able to buy someone's music and use it for my podcast was helpful to me and helpful to them so they could make some money. But then also this reinvention, what they say of learning, we're going to be able to do things like these types of academies that are online and learn things faster than we could ever imagine. And I've used it, too, to learn various tasks, to put things into charts for me. When I found something was difficult for me to understand, I've used AI to help explain it to me better. My own learning has gotten better. And will the change of policies as we look at robots and AI? It's going to be interesting to see what happens. It says that we've had so many robots already in existence, everything from the robots that will clean your house to bricklaying and 3D printers, all sorts of things can be created. And that has allowed people then to do other kinds of jobs. The world is going to be an interesting place to see how do we employ people, give them salaries when we have robots doing their jobs. They mentioned too that a 2017 survey found by the consulting company in Deloitte found that 41% of companies were considering using AI or some type of automatic process to do their work. 
So it's something we're going to have to work with and compete with for sure. Of course, it's amazing when we can use these tools to make ourselves better, to produce better things. But when we're concerned about how we're going to pay the bills or have a job in five years, it's worrisome. I feel a little confident because my job is a job that requires human beings, or at least I think so, and I just don't see myself getting replaced by a robot anytime soon. But I can see a lot of people with that concern. And they said that the overall trend with these gig economies, our 24-hour-a-day work world where everything is going on all the time, our regular jobs are being replaced by contracting, they say project work, all these other smaller tasks, different activities, instead of just going into the office from nine to five. Now, when I got out of college, I noticed too, there was a lot of articles that was talking about how everyone was going to be a contractor because it was the rise of these temp agencies. And they say, oh, well, these temp agencies are so appealing. We're not going to have real employees anymore. We're all going to become temp workers daily contractors, and we're not going to have real jobs. That never happened. But that was the big concern, is that why would some company want to hire someone permanently when they can just get an office day worker to come in every day and do the jobs? It didn't turn out to be true, because companies want to have consistency. They want to have the good people in the office that they'll know will get things done. But I think if you're the kind of person who doesn't want to work particularly hard, and doesn't feel like they want to work on any skills, improving themselves, making themselves more valuable to a company and to what they love doing, I think they are going to have problems. I don't think it's anyone listening to this podcast because you're all people who are trying to do better. But we're going to have to work on what we do about people losing these jobs. They say now the gig employees, which are a little bit like the temp workers when I got out of college, come in four different categories. One, they call free agents. Those are people who work independently, maybe like the person who wrote the song for my podcast. The casual earner, that might be someone who has a job, but they earn a little bit of extra money driving Uber, renting out an Airbnb, just a little extra money. Then they say there's the reluctant. That's a person who doesn't want to work at all (laughs) or dreams of doing something that's outside the office but just hasn't gotten there yet. And then the last stage is the financially strapped, they say, the person who really just does independent work because they can't make ends meet. You know, when I've traveled to cities and gone on customer trips, I've met all four of those people driving cars and doing all sorts of things. So they give some skills in this book that are going to be important in our future. And that's going to be things like science, math, like they said before, financial literacy. You can have all the robot advisors you want, but you have to have a human being who's going to help people through this process and listen to them and hear their needs. People who are creative, good communicators, good collaborators, people who are very culturally, artistically aware, because again, art, I don't think is going to have much interest in AI. I know a lot of people are doing podcasts art and other types of art with AI, but are you going to put a painting on your wall that was done by AI? Maybe as an oddity, but I think part of what we like about art, whether it's music or it's physical wall hanging art, is we like to see the personal view of it. Just like this podcast, if I had AI write my podcast and then I just read them, or maybe I even hired a different AI to read them, is that interesting to you? I think there's going to be a role in place for people who have that cultural view. And then we're going to have to have a lot of initiative. They say we're going to have to have grit, which means we're going to have to look and determine what it is we can do in this new world. And sometimes that's going to be looking really hard to find our place in the world. Being adaptable is going to be important because those jobs might be a little bit more interesting than they have been in the past. I can tell you jobs now are more interesting than they were in the past. And having leadership ability. It's one thing to have a bunch of robots, but you have to have people who are good leaders who make good decisions in the working world, regardless of how many robots there are. 
In fact, they're going to have to be the wise ones that will come up with when we use AI and robots and when we don't. They said that all of this is going to be the rise of what you call the emotional work, which means that putting our humanity in our work, our emotions into our work, are going to become even more important. Doesn't mean you go around and cry on everyone's shoulder, but that human experience in the job is going to be what companies are going to be looking for to counterweight the strict rules, the computer programming of AI and robots. There was a funny line in there that said that we're trying to decide whether this is going to be Blade Runner, which is a very negative view of the future, or the Jetsons. And if you don't know the Jetsons, they were a cartoon where he got in his flying plane, buzzed over to work, worked on a computer all day, making widgets at the factory, and then got home. Didn't seem like very much longer because the world was the future. And so the work world was very pleasant, non-stressful, and everything in his life fit in a briefcase. So which world are we going to have? We're obviously going to have to be able to take some risks, find our jobs, and try new ideas. In this book, they gave this pattern that you'll have to have an idea, test it, it either succeeds and we continue it, or we have failure, we pivot to a new thing, and then we get a new idea and start over. You're going to have to be a person who is agile and tries to think outside the box about what kind of job you're going to have. They gave a quote without any um, citation in it that said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there, which means it's no longer going to be a place to have some sort of haphazard view of our work world. If you don't have a plan, if you can't think about what you want to do, what you don't want to do, it's going to be hard for you because there's always going to be a robot ready to take those jobs that are there for basically people without a plan. You're going to have to start thinking about what you like to do, what you're good at doing, and what you're going to do to leverage the thing that you're good at and make a company want to hire you because you have that specific skill. So they give some suggestions about what we can do in this robot world is that you have to understand yourself. You're going to have to understand and explore your values and your whys. You're going to have to look at what your personal brand is. I'm not a big fan of that phrase, but what it means is, you know, what exactly are you good at? And what are you trying to sell to a company that you will be good at? And then if you fail, make sure you fail well, which means that you're going to fail. You're going to learn something about yourself, and it's going to equip you to be better at the next thing you try. And build your confidence. Okay. So that didn't work very well. What can I do instead? So maybe something for me is I decide I'm going to write a blog. And then I find out I'm not a very good blog writer, I'm not good at writing, and I don't enjoy it. How can I take that experience and turn it into something else? Oh, podcasting. I'm a better talker than I'm a writer. Now I'm failing well. And then knowing what you want to do next. It's going to be important that you have a direction says that we're also going to have to not get too comfortable. We're going to always have to keep our eyes out, keep exploring for the next thing, and finding out what will make you happy, what will use your gifts and talents, always having that eye that's available. Even in my own world, I work in the software industry, and, you know, it's ever-changing. I heard that Microsoft laid off a big majority of its senior staff, regardless of how good they were, because they were trying to save money. If you can't think outside the box, be agile, be prepared for something that's going to happen to you, you might get stuck. And so they say in this book, what you have to start doing is imagine that you're a compass. I love this analogy. Because instead of having a map, I'm going to go from A to B. Instead, you're going to be a compass. And you know the general direction that you're going. You know where you want to get to. This knowledge of yourself, your knowledge of your industry or your work world, and what you want to do, what you're good at doing, is going to be great because it'll be like a video game where you see the next boulder to leap to because you know exactly where it is you need to go. Being the compass, 
maybe not the exact thing, but the general direction. (laughs) They suggest that you do small things every day that makes you feel uneasy, has a little bit of risk to it. And they say it's something that's called a, quote, bold fit, meaning you're going to take that next leap. And the last steps are to make sure that you invest in yourself. It talks about eating well, sleeping well, getting fit. But I think it's true, too. That that means you also have to invest in your education. Learn the next important thing. If you're not very good at writing, take a class. Do something to fix that hole. Or if you're really great at something, but you're just this short at being awesome at that thing, find out what class you have to take to take that next step. And I think in the end, we're going to have to also figure out how to help our children. That's going to be the harder question. Probably for me and maybe some of you, this next leap in the world of AI and robots is not going to affect us, but it's going to affect the next generation. But it is going to affect our children, our grandchildren, and we're going to have to help them figure out how to navigate this really interesting world. It's all about the people because robots, They can't do the people part as well as people can do the people part. And so the best thing that you can do is just realize your world is not going to be a straight line anymore. Again, you're a compass. And you're going to want to give back. You're going to want to help people to make them reach their goals. And when you do that, you'll start building up a name for yourself as someone who makes things possible. As people who are able to help other people, which again, a robot can't do. And they said that we'll have to keep that eye out, understand what's going on around us, have a plan and take some chances and not be scared of the future, not worry about the future, but instead bring it on and be bold about what is going to happen next. Doesn't help to be lamentful about it, I feel bad for the writers who are on strike and this complication about what's going on in Hollywood when it comes to AI. But you're not going to put the genie back in the bottle. This is here to stay. Think of AI as going to be our new search engine, our new way of doing almost everything that we have to deal with when it comes to research, understanding something, and learning something new. And it's not going to go away. There's no rule the government can make. There's no collective bargaining thing you can do that's going to prevent this from happening. We're going to have to realize that jobs are going to change and we're going to have to change too. We're going to have to get involved in more skills, lifetime learning, and figure out how you can work with robots and AI instead of against them. Because again, this genie is not going back in the bottle. And so we have to be better at using these tools instead of being afraid of them. The best thing I can tell you is try to learn it. See what you can do to stay current. Keep learning about it. There's all sorts of books and articles. And even if you ask AI, teach me how to write better prompts. It will. It'll show you how to use AI better. And so instead of avoiding this and pretending it doesn't exist, now's your time to get good at this, to learn how to use it. And when you learn how to use it, You'll be able to help yourself, you'll help the team, you'll help your children and your grandchildren do better in the future of the work world, and start thinking about what it is you could do that will make everything around you better by using robots and AI. But hopefully they won't turn into Battlestar Galactica, because that would be really terrible. Until they turn into Battlestar Galactica Cylons, we still can use AI to make our lives better to make our work world better, and help equip us for the next jobs to come. So my challenge to you is take the small step and start playing with different kinds of AI. There's artistic AI. There is the language AI, like ChatGPT. Notion has an AI. Grammarly has an AI. All sorts of different AIs out there that you can try. Test them out. Become better at giving them prompts, aka instructions, so that you can get out of the system what you want to. Learn exactly what it takes in order to get better at this, and that will equip you 
for the next world to come. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. I'd love to hear what you think about this. Is AI going to affect your life or do you think your job is AI proof? Let me know what you think. And remember, our steps into the future with or without Cylons starts with small steps. Small steps.